Yesterday's White House press briefing was followed by a debate after a Wire reporter ended the session early. Now, it's a long-standing tradition that the Associated Press starts and ends the briefing. But Monday, White House reporters argued that journalists in the front row had monopolized Jen Psaki's time and that reporters in the back had more questions. White House reporter for Real Clear Politics, Philip Wegman, was in the Philip Wegman. Sorry, I just messed your name up. Was in the White House press <laughs> briefing room, and he tweeted in part, "What is the utility of empowering a wire service to call an end to a briefing? Is it for the benefit of the press secretary, a few reporters in the front row, or the entire press corps?" Philip joins us now to expand on this beef in the briefing room that apparently went down. So, Philip, look, like uh, you know, uh, I'm an average person. I don't, I'm not uh, one of these White House reporters or I, yeah, I've been to DC like twice in my life. Most people are in my position. We don't know what the heck this is, what, what you guys are talking about. So can you explain this in normal person terms? What normally happens? What happened? What's the big fight about? And you're absolutely right, Kim, because this isn't just insider baseball. Uh, this is insider baseball inside the umpire's <laughs> locker room yeah. before the game. But it's totally. hugely consequential. It's usually consequential more than just the normal griping from reporters because, like Robbie said a moment ago, uh, the wire services traditionally, they start the briefing with the first question, and then towards the end, they say, thank you, Jen, signaling that the briefing has come to a close. Uh, this was a tradition going back to Helen Thomas uh, before my time, and it was resurrected during the Biden era. The thought here is that you want a collegial briefing room, you want things to run smoothly, uh, but as we just saw, there's a bit of frustration because what generally happens is the press secretary, she calls on reporters in the first three rows. Think about uh, your legacy media, the big networks, the big, big papers of record, and then some of the other questions, if the briefing doesn't last longer than 45 minutes or an hour, some of the other questions uh, about other topics don't get answered. And so the reason this matters is it is fundamentally a question of who gets to question the press secretary, the president's spokesperson. Not only does that set the tone for the day, but it really flavors uh, the way that the administration reacts. I mean, we have seen a single question turn uh, the action of the administration previously. And so I think that this gripe is hugely consequential. And I expect that the White House Correspondents Association is going to have to deal with this uh, because it's not just enough uh, to you know, lean back on a old tradition without explaining the merits of it. And it would be one thing if the reporters in the first three rows were all asking different kind of hard hitting questions. But and, Philip, you've seen me in there a couple of times now. And <laughs> what, I've, what I've noticed is that this, the same question gets asked like six or seven times. So even if 20 questions. Six 20, or seven would be a mercy. It's right. asked it's like, more than that. Over and over and over. Like, let me ask this a different way. See if I can mm -hmm. get some incremental news out of, you know, who did the president meet with on the short list of the Supreme Court and when are we going to. Like, nothing that is a, actually going to advance any policy anywhere. Uh, right. And so uh, the, when it then gets cut off before it gets to other r reporters, then the public isn't going to hear, you know, isn't going to see the press secretary uh, get, get challenged there. And so you and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday. So wh what is, why, why would the AP reporter call it? You know, why wouldn't the AP reporter just say, you know what, I got to go, see ya. Like, why do they, why do they need to still be there? My sense of the tradition is that it's twofold. First, the carrot here is that it says to the administration, we're gonna help you out. We're gonna make certain that this briefing doesn't turn into a marathon, that you're not here for an hour and a half, two hours long, and sort of keep things running smoothly. The stick though, is that if the reporter from the AP or, or the wire service that's in that chair that day, if they don't call it, then it's up to the White House themselves to say, all right, we're out. We don't want to face any more scrutiny. We're going to leave. It's a small thing, and maybe it doesn't actually lead to better behavior, more transparency for the administration if the wire doesn't call the briefing. But um, at very least, there is a serious question of regulatory capture here uh, of whether or not this institution is actually to the benefit of the press corps overall or to the benefit of a number of reporters who are just in the first 
two or three rows. And you're absolutely right um, when, when you say that, that, Ryan, because there have been moments where you have uh, different networks asking the same question again and again because they need their cut shot for their news package. I don't begrudge them um, one bit, but it does get frustrating when you hear again and again a question about, oh, hey, have you not named a Fed nominee yet? And Jen Psaki <laughs> laughs and says to the reporter, no, I haven't, but thank you for asking. Same thing with uh, the Supreme Court nominees. We knew that they were going to be buttoned up. We knew that they they weren't going to give um, an answer on that, but reporters kept trying. They kept eating clock. And the reason why that's significant is because then you don't have other reporters who have an opportunity to ask hugely consequential questions about, oh, by the way, what is going to happen to all that aid that was promised to Afghanistan? Is that going to languish in a bank account somewhere? Or is that going to go to widows and orphans? So on and so forth. Hugely massive implication questions that don't get get answered. And it's not just that you have these other reporters who are saying, you know, I want some of the spotlight. I want my mother to see me on television. No, you ask questions, not just for the soundbite from the press secretary. You ask questions so that you can knock loose other sources and say, hey, the press secretary said that she would circle back on this. She gave me an answer that differs from yours. Let's move. Let's get a better idea of what you're actually doing instead of you know just having some reporters ask questions that they know that the press secretary is not going to give an answer to so is, is there a signed seating yeah i, mean, I was, just, I was yes. just gonna yeah, actually ask that too but yes yeah. there is but how do you how do you uh gain or lose clout in such a sense that your chair can change mm -hmm. So the White House Correspondents Association, and good on them, um, CBS Radio News' Stephen Portnoy, uh, as well as the board, they are aware of the fact that media is changing. I mean, this tradition, sure, it's, it's come into question, but in terms of what that briefing room looks like, they have moved um, significant uh, you know, resources around. They've said, we need to make certain that it's not just legacy media up front. We need to account uh, for, for new uh, voices and they've they've sort of rearranged what the briefing room looks like but you know if you're in the the fourth row um you sort of are, are left with the expectation that maybe you'll get one question a week that, that you'll just have to keep your hand uh raised constantly to do your best to to try and 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 be in, involved there um but yeah, the, the seating is the seating in the room is is significant. WHCA controls that. But the the reason why there's so much I think bubbling frustration here is two things. First, the question is why was this tradition brought back? It went away during the Trump years. Why why was it brought back? Is it to the benefit of the White House? Because all of us, you know, we're we're supposed to hold um, uh, power to account, not help power keep the, the trains running on time, or is it to the benefit of the press corps? And the fact that that was not succinctly answered sort of raises the question of, was this tradition brought back just for nostalgia's sake? Because certainly we wouldn't just want that. Um, but when, the other when, issue- When did it end and when is it brought back? It, Sorry. So, so it, it sort of ended during the Trump years and then it was uh, brought back at okay. the beginning of the Biden administration. The other issue here, though, and I think this is still simmering, is there are a lot of reporters in the rows four, five, six, and seven who they saw bad behavior during the previous administration. They saw individual correspondents turn that briefing room into a um, dress rehearsal for a prime time spot. They saw shouting, they saw people hog the microphone, they saw people um, pull all sorts of stunts in there. And there's going to be a temptation for people who are playing by the rules, who are trying to do uh, you know, what they're supposed to normally, just raise their hand, be polite, to say, you know, wait a minute, for a lot of people in the previous administration for the last four years, they were rewarded for being cantankerous and interrupting. Why would we sit back and just show up to briefings, not get called on, listen to our colleagues in the front couple of rows, ask repetitive questions, and just sit there like potted plants? So this is something that the press is going to have to sort out. It's going to be difficult and painful. Um, and maybe outside of DC, people don't uh, tune into this discussion, but it's it's hugely consequential. And one would think that at a moment when trust in media is sort of on the downturn, that we would have these internal discussions uh, that right. lead to you know 
external results. Well, and right. that, that's what it sounds like to me. I mean, what it sounds like just from listening to all of this and now kind of understanding and wrapping my brain around it is, uh, I mean, this just feeds into the suspicion that many of us have, which is that it's all a bunch of collusion, basically, between the press and certain administrations. Clearly, uh, you know, potentially this administration that it's, oh, OK, if it's assigned. So you're telling me it's assigned seating in this room that the only people that get to sit in the first front three rows are the legacy media, which many of us do not trust. And then they're asking the same questions over and over and over again, even after they've been answered over and over and over again. And so we're just getting the same crap that's being put out there nonstop. And it is all it sounds planned out. And then some some, you know, journalist or supposedly then shuts the meeting down before anybody with a good question is able to ask one that's actually going to challenge the administration. So it just sounds like a bunch of incestuous collusion, which is what a lot of us have always suspected to begin with. And now sounds like it's confirmed to some degree. I, I, I will say this, though, um, certainly White House press secretaries, it is their prerogative to call on whoever they want. Um, if they have had a bad interaction with a reporter, yeah, that reporter is probably going to see their questions limited. And there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat and journalists have to be creative and aggressive. Um, Jen Psaki does deserve praise, though, because in comparison to her predecessors in the Obama administration, she is much more willing to go around the room to hustle and to take questions from a, a varied number of outlets. The thing about that, though, is that when you start taking questions, not just from one, two or three rows, but start taking a larger range of questions, that it that means that there is more ground to cover. That's more opportunities for someone to perhaps stray from the administration's line and, uh, you know, open up new cans of worms. That's great for reporters right. because, you know, we want more access and transparency from the administration's perspective. You know, that's a danger. And so I think that as the White House Correspondents Association has this uh, conversation inside the umpire's locker room, they're going to have to make certain that everyone involved knows that if there is a tradition that is for the benefit of the entire press corps or at least lay out what the thinking is so you know philip when i first showed up if you remember i asked you so does everybody get a question here and then they and then they wrap it up <laughs> and everybody <laughs> laughed like oh no definitely not how it goes so you know you and i you know both have an interest in breaking up this cartel because we're we're yeah. bo both lucky if we can get you know i squat a, a fourth row seat if i can get one, but if the person shows up, then I'm, I'm against the wall. So, you know, where do you think that, where do you think this leads? Mm -hmm. um, so tradition, if it is grounded in some sort of principle, generally leads to better results. But if it's based off of just nostalgia, then someone else is going to take advantage of that. Um, there's always an opportunity for someone to gain an advantage. And I think that what we have seen from the press corps thus far is we, we have seen aggressive questions. And absolutely, there are times when the same question has to be asked you know, over and over again on a consequential topic. But I think that, you know, as we see the media landscape change and as we see, uh, you know, voters expect not just, you know, the, the same um, coverage as before, but expect, you know, the White House to be um, poked and prodded in, in new different ways, uh, there, there's going to have to be some sort of change. Um, and certainly I don't think that, you uh, leaving it to the goodwill of individual reporters is going to be enough because frankly you know there have been times you know when i've been called on and i've thought to myself all right this is my moment i'm not just going to ask one or two questions i'm going to try and get as many as possible because i don't know when i'm going to be called on again i've been lucky to get you know one or two questions a week but i think that perhaps um, you know, there's going to have to be a gentleman's agreement inside of that room. And hopefully the impetus is to get better, unique coverage, not just to make certain that, uh, you know, regular players get seen uh, regularly. Yeah. Yeah. We, well, the American people, I think, would like to see a lot more questions asked. And maybe it could be like a lottery system. I would like to see her have to pull names out of a hat <laughs> and then say, OK, now, and if they look and if they want to prepare in advance, I get it. If the administration wants all the questions in advance, I get I don't know how that works. I don't know what the I don't know what the ethics are on that. 
it seems like, but yeah. you know, then they can maybe prepare and okay. But if you happen to call that person's name out of that hat, they get to ask you that question, whatever that question might be, and you've got to answer it. And if your answer ends up being, you know, one of those typical, just shoving it aside of, oh, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that. And you say that over and over again, that reflects poorly on the administration. This just looks like it's giving the opportunity for the administration to cover their tracks. And that's my big problem with this. Yeah. Well, we got to leave it there. Philip, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, Florida's Surgeon General officially recommends against vaccinating healthy kids. We'll discuss that coming up next.